Now, just to put into context as regards this passage of scripture, God is restoring his people from Babylonia and he is bringing them back to Jerusalem, which is in Judah. We saw something of the covenant that God makes with the kingdom of Judah, the Davidic covenant, which abides in all eternity. And so here we have uh, the people of God uh, that God has made a covenant with. He judged them and he punished them. He sent them to captivity. But because he's a faithful God, he restores them back to their land. And if you would, in a short while, before we look at chapter number two, go back to chapter number one, we probably need to remind ourselves as regards the reason, not reasons, but the reason God is restoring these people back to their land. That purpose is set right from the outset. For example, in chapter number one and verse number two, when Cyrus gives, gives of something of the decree, the Bible says, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So he says, whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And so it says, and let each survivor in whatever place is a John's be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with woods and with beasts, that is animals, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So God is restoring his people back to Jerusalem, the city of David, city of peace, that they may go and enjoy peace of God there with the King Christ Jesus. We know that in the New Covenant, this peace reigns forever because it's the Prince of Peace. But in this particular context of Scripture, the purpose for restoration is the rebuilding of the house of God in Jerusalem. And that is for the purpose of worship. In other words, what you're saying is that God is restoring worship amongst his people. Remember, when his people were away from Jerusalem, there's no way they would have gathered corporately to worship him because the temple was destroyed. We saw last time we were here that the temple was the central you know, focus of the people of God, just like the tabernacle and the tent of meeting during the time of Moses was central. At the time these people are being taken into captivity, the temple that has been built by Solomon, son of David, remember that covenant with David, this temple has been destroyed. The people has been taken away from the land, ripped off from the land and plucked out and taken to captivity in Babylon. And that disrupts worship of God. They can't worship, they can't sacrifice, they can't pray. Because Solomon, when he was dedicating the temple, he did plead with God that if your people who are called by your name shall, you know, humble themselves and they shall come to this house and they shall plead for mercy and for grace and pray when you afflict them with all sorts of afflictions, please hear them and answer their prayers. And God acknowledged and said, I will do so as you have required of me. And so they are away from the land. God now is in the business of restoring them back to their land, which is in Jerusalem, in Judah, that they may go and worship. Which is why, if you look at, for example, chapter number two now, you realize that in verse number two, for example, chapter two, we are told that as they are returning, they came with Zerubbabel. And we said last Sunday that Zerubbabel tops the list because he is going to champion the rebuilding of the temple. We shall see that in the subsequent chapters of this book. But then followed closely with Jeshua. 
That Yeshua is the priest, the, the high priest, who shall be representing the people of God. We shall see of something of his ministry. And please do get hold of the book of Zechariah, and you will find there the story of Yeshua as he represents the people of God in worship in the temple. So that list is deliberate in terms of the arrangement of the names. We also saw last God's day that names of the returnees are given, their genealogies, their towns are given, they are identified with God and with God's people. And so they are identified as God's people. It is established that they belong to the covenant of God because they are linked to the people who once lived in that land but were taken to captivity. There is genealogy, there is descent that is mentioned in those names, used by the word sons of. Today, as we look at chapter number 2 and from verses 36 and following, we are seeing of something of how the returnees, the restored, the remnants of God, should now prepare themselves to worship God. This chapter prepares us as regards how they will now worship God when finally the temple is installed. Remember, the temple will be rebuilt. But before the temple is rebuilt, in chapter number two, we are seeing of something of the preparation as regards those who will serve in the temple. And you see, we're going to see the categories of them. These are the people who will serve God in the temple. God takes it seriously as regards how he's worshipped, even in the temple. And so there is this chapter of preparation as we look at those names. Those names are there to help us know that when it comes to the worship of God, I'm repeating myself, it matters the subject of preparation. People of God must prepare themselves as they worship God. And so these particular people in this covenant are getting ready. They are ready themselves for the worship of God before the temple is established. For example, look at chapter number, verse number 68, 68, you will there see something of uh, worship that will take place in the temple, other aspects of it will be shown to us in a short while, but in verse number 68, we are told that some of the heads of families when they came to the house of the Lord, that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. They, the temple has not been established, but they locate the temple location, the initial temple foundation. They find it, and there they offer free will offerings to the Lord. They are anticipating that the temple shall actually be built. In other words, they are acting in faith that here the temple will actually be rebuilt. And so they offer free will offerings in that particular place. And remember, that's why I drew attention to chapter 1 and verse number 4, because in that particular edict of the king, Cyrus, Cyrus says, let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And so they, when they were leaving Babylonia, their neighbors gave them gifts to give to the house of God. Part of it are this, what we are calling free will offerings. These things they would offer in the temple of God. And so their business as they return to the land is to worship God. They are offering to the God free will offerings. The servants in the temple are being ordered here. They are being structured, they are being ordered. The census is taking place here. There's registration taking place as regards those who will serve God in this temple. And so this section, as we shall see, this, uh, see today, is helping us to appreciate of something of how God's people, before they come to worship God in the temple, after it has been built, how the people of God should approach worship. All right. How should God's people belonging to his covenant like us, the new covenant, approach God in worship? All right. What is it that they're doing that is helping us to see that truly speaking, as they are returned, as they are taken back, restored as remnants, they are keen on worship. 
They are careful as regards worship. First of all, observe with me that in this chapter, these people value every ministry in that temple house. Every person serving the temple is valued. And this will help us that even us in the new covenant, as we approach God, the attitude that should characterize us is the attitude that every ministry is valued. Observe with me, for example, commencing in verse number 36, that in this context of scripture, every ministry in this temple is going to be valued. Whether great or small, these ministries that are mentioned here, we're going to look at them shortly, are essential to God when it comes to public corporate worship. This is worship taking place here. They are being prepared for this. And I'm going to say it here from this pulpit that you must underscore the fact that public worship matters to God. And so even in heaven, what takes place there is not in individual worship. People in heaven, the angels and the redeemed beings, they worship God corporately. They all fall down and worship. Not every person in their own court. They are keen on public worship. What we are doing today as we are gathered here is called public worship. This is one of the marks of true salvation. This is one of the marks of the true church, true saints. A true saint, just like this covenant community, is keen on public worship. Because God is a God of salvation and he saves for the purpose of worship. The chief end of man is to glorify God and live for God forever. And enjoy it. that very good. And so public worship matters. We must approach that public worship right. First of all, every ministry, like in this context of the local church, must be valued. Verse number 36. We are told, the priests, and then they are named, the sons of Jediah, of the house of Jeshua, 973, the sons of Emer, 1052, the sons of Pashur, 1247, the sons of Harim, 1017. We are given of something of the genealogy of the priests. Even the number of the priests that are going to serve are given to us. Carefully given to us. God is taking details carefully, like we said last Thursday. It, it begins with the priests. Just observe the, the order in which they are going to occur. So the priests are named. That is one of the ministries in the temple. The second ministry is verse number 40. We find there the Levites. Are we there? The Levites are given to us. The Levites were supportive of the priest ministry. They support the ministry of the priests. So we are told of something of the Levites, the sons of Jeshua and Cadmiel, of the sons of Odaviah, 74, and that is given to us. It does not stop there. There's another ministry. So the ministry of the priests is given to us. The ministry of the Levites to support the uh, priests given to us at least, those who will serve. These are the people who will serve. Names are given to us as regards those who will serve when the temple is made. Their number is also given to us, carefully given to us. Because worship must be ordered. It must be organized. Public worship. Thirdly, the group that follows is in verse number 41. The singers. The singers are the sons of Esau, and they are 128. Are we together? You see that list? It is carefully arranged. Fourthly, in verse number 42, the sons of the gatekeepers given to us. These are the sons of Shalom, the sons of Achar, the sons of Talmon, the sons of Aku, the sons of Atataita, the sons of Shobai. They are all one that nine in number. So the priests, the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, the fifth group is in verse 43. The fifth group. We are told there, the temple servants, the temple servants, they are the sons of Zaiha, the sons of Hashupa, 
the sons of Tabaoth, the sons of Keros, the sons of Seaha, the sons of Padon. And the list continues, and we find there the list of the temple servants. These are people who were assist within the temple. They're given to us. It goes in the sixth place to verse 55, another group of people given to us there, as regarding those who will serve in the temple when it's built. The other category is the sons of Solomon's servants. Those are the sons of Sotiah, the sons of Asopheroth, the sons of Eroda, the sons of Jaan, the sons of Dakon, the sons of Gideon, the sons of Shephatiah, the sons of Hatim, the sons of Pochereth, Hazebim, the sons of Ammon. They are told that all the temple servants and the sons of Solomon's servants were 392. Surely, you begin to see that this list is carefully crafted. Beginning with the priests, to the list. It is deliberate in that way. Just like the names in verse number 2 is given in ascending order, in descending order, from the greatest to the least. Here, the same thing is happening. And what is the message? The message is simple, that every ministry in the temple of God matters. It is valued. Right from the greatest to the least. And that is the attitude that we, mu we must espouse as we approach worship, corporate worship. That in corporate worship, every ministry is valued. And that's why the writer goes into details to give us of their numbers and genealogies where they come from, and how they are connected to this lineage given to us. Brothers and sisters, this is essential to us when we come to worship. The question is in our covenant of grace, the covenant that we are in the new covenant. Does this principle apply? Where every ministry in a local church matters when it comes to the worship of God. Now to the application, we turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. Please turn with me there and see that it applies in our case. That every ministry, whether great or small, when it comes to the worship of God, it matters to God. Whether they are singers, whether they are just temple servants, whether they are Levites or priests, or just sons of servants, whether they are but, uh, you know, gatekeepers, you know, sometimes when you gloss over this text of scripture, you're wondering why gatekeepers are mentioned here. Gatekeepers probably now sight at the least, but they are mentioned here, even the numbers given here. God cares about them. Because God cares about those who suffer. Even the list of the positions, God cares about them. It does not matter the size and the capacity of your ministry. What matters to God is that that ministry is valued by God. Even the gatekeepers are valued by God, just like the priests. And God gives us of their number and names. Please, that should affect how we think of ministry in a local church. So then turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians and chapter number 12 and appreciate of this principle that we must apply in our ongoing context in this local church. Of Kisum. From verse number 12 of chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, as we apply this reality that every ministry, according to God, it matters. So, Paul writes 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 12 For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. So it continues to speak to us, verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the, to the body. That would not make it less a part of the body. In other words, every part of the body matters to that body of yours. It is the analogy of the human body. 
verse number 16. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, there would be the sense, where well, the sense of hearing. In other words, we would not have the ear. If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell? Don't have the nose. But as it is, God arranged the members of the, in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, there would be, where uh, would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Now it gets interesting from verse number, six, number 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Not nor again, the head to the, to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Observe that carefully. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now remember the gatekeepers the other side. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the great honor and our and presentable parts are treated with greater modesty. In other words, there are certain parts of the body, we don't see them, but we cover them with clothes, because they matter. But God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that, is, that, it, that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. The application of the text is very simple. That we, in a local church like this, should be able to recognize and appreciate every ministry in the local church. Every member of the local church, in their smallest way of contribution, matters to God. Yes, their contribution to us may be limited, may be little, may be something insignificant, but not in the eyes of God. In the eyes of God, every contribution matters, and He values it. God values that contribution. Even those serving in private capacities, because we have public ministries and we have private ministries, those who will not be in the front line like us, publicly speaking, are not less of value. In other words, there is this idea that there are certain ministries that are more important in local church. What have you seen to be the result? Because everyone thinks that to be an apostle is the most important thing. To be a prophet is the most important thing. So everyone to become a prophet. Everyone starts to become a prophet. And so for you to have graduated, you must graduate to become an apostle and a prophet. You have seen people graduating to become a reverend, to become the bishop, because they think that the bishop is the most important person in the church. The Bible has no idea of that. That is a human idea. In the eyes of God, the word bishop is just the word elder and the word pastor. I can't understand where we get the hierarchy from. It's because we have, not, we have refused to read our Bibles. And so we think that this is very important. This other ministry is not important, and that was the problem in Corinth. In Corinth, some people were arguing that they are lesser ministries, so they were running away from those lesser ministries. And they were talking down those they thought had lesser ministries. So there was competition and rival. You can imagine a church whereby everyone wants to speak in tongues. Everyone wants to prophesy. That was the context of one Corinthians, because they thought that those ministers are very powerful. It is not lost to us that this is what a bad thing we can. Far be it from us to think that way. In the eyes of God, every ministry is valued, whether public or private, whether small or great. God values those ministries. And so, in this context, we see the book of Ezra. Don't just have priests alone. We have priests, we have Levites, 
we have singers, sons of Esau, we have the gatekeepers and their sons, we have the temple servants, and we even have the sons of Solomon's servants. Because all of them matter to God. They are going to contribute to the worship of the temple. Although, in terms of structure, there is sort of, you know, appreciation of the fact that the priests have the public law, it does not mean that the gatekeepers are lesser people in their service. So, let me submit to you that there are some that are serving as elders in the local church, some are serving as deacons, some are serving as those giving hospitality, those cleaning the, sub, the, the church, those serving people, whatever in, involvement you are uh, in the local church, it does not mean that the pastor is superior. It only means that we have different responsibilities. It is a matter of roles and responsibilities, not a matter of importance. Because all these people given to us here belong to that covenant, the old covenant. But something else, in the second place, is the fact that not only do we see in this context that every uh, ministry is valued, but secondly, every minister is vetted. Observe in the second place, as you close. That, yes, this is true, that every ministry is valued. But secondly, every minister is vetted. Please come with me to verses. 59 to 63, and observe that it is true that those ministries, especially those public ministries, must be vetted. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, let me submit to you uh, right from the outset that our problem in Kenya is a lack of appreciation of this approach to public worship, such that People who do not qualify to be those officers sneak themselves in to those officers. And so the word we use in our Kenyan context is self-proclaimed apostle, self-proclaimed prophet. I can just wake up in the morning, I yawn, and I stretch in my bed and say, I feel like being an apostle today. Then I come and announce that the Lord gave me promotion in that mighty, mighty dream, in that vision, in that mighty visitation. Which visitation you never open up. So how do I convince you? So I come on Sunday and the following Sunday, I come and tell you, I've been a pastor for so long. I want to become a bishop now. I feel the Lord has anointed me to now become an apostle. Who qualifies you to be that? Let's observe the text. That there's such a thing as qualification. There's such a thing as betting of those who serve, especially in those public offices like priests. And we will see that the similar promise and the similar pattern is duplicated in the new covenant. There is always betting of ministers. Verses 59 to 63. Read with me. The following were those who came up from Tel Mela, Tel Hasha, Cheru, Adan, and Iman. Though they could not prove their father's houses or their descent, whether they belong to Israel. 16. The sons of Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, and the sons of Nekoda, 652. Also, the sons of the priests, the sons of Habai, the sons of Hakoz, the sons of Basilai, who had taken a wife from the daughters of Basilai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. Now look at verse 62. These sought their registration among those enrolled in the genealogies, but they were not found there. And so they were excluded from the priesthood as unclean. Are you together? There's betting here. Do you qualify to be a priest? As a result, they are excluded. Look at verse 63, what should be done? The governor told them that they were not to partake of the most holy food until there should be a priest to consult the Urim and Thorium. 
There's a human frame, the breastplate, they had some uh, sort of two metal plates that would be used as sort of a uh, uh, for uh, what we call uh, what we do is dice, probably a dice, something like that. So you determine by casting a lot of us. You kind of lost with those urine and thumen and whatever uh, is the outcome, yes or no, you determine something. And so they are being careful here because they can't find these people in the names of the priests. They say you cannot serve until it is determined that you can serve. Although they claim that they are sons of prophets, that does not qualify them to serve. They claim alone does not satisfy. It must be verified. It must be validated. They must be confirmed. It must be asserted that they, they are qualified. They are qualified to serve as priests. So that even the most holy food they can't taste. In other words, they can't serve. Every minister must be vetted. Especially those serving in the public space. Those who do not meet the set criteria for ministry are excluded from service. There must be an establishment of the legitimacy, that legitimacy of the claim that someone is a minister. Otherwise, we'll just go to bed and sleep, wake up in a vision and a dream and come and say, the Lord has spoken to me that I'm supposed to be a pastor. He doesn't say that. There is the regulative principle of worship when it comes to service. Those serving must be subjected to the regulative principle of worship, which is, do they meet the set criteria to serve? It is no wonder in this context of us as Kenyans, we have so many rock pastors and apostles. Who better them? Ask the question, who vetted your pastor? Who vetted your apostle? Or he told you, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. Because you ask the question, when did God speak to you? You need to ask yourself as you go back home, who vetted your pastor so that he's fit for the office? Who vetted your apostle to be fit for that office? Here there's vetting. If you are biblical, this is the criteria. There must be qualification. This is a public office. Priests who lead the worship. The priests were tasked with the responsibility of leading worship in the temple. Just like the pastors of the day. So the question has to be, who vets them? Do they meet the criteria? Now, some of you will meet this by a shock. The members of this church may not surprise you. Please last turn to the New Testament and see that this venting continues even the new covenant. 1 Timothy chapter 3. There is vetting of ministers. They must meet the qualification, whether they or elders. 1 Timothy and in chapter number 3. And I shall tell you why that is important in that very context of scripture. 1 Timothy, let's read from verse number 1. 1 Timothy 3 from verse number 1. The Bible says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. That's no problem at all. But it doesn't end there. It does not end with the desire. Alright? Let's go to verse number two. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. We are not dealing with the qualifications. An overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife. Are we talking? Sober minded, self controlled, respectable, hospitable able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, 
not quarrelsome, but a love, not a love of money. Are, are we together? Let's read that again. Not a love of money. I'm talking to Kenyans. Surely, if your pastor every Sunday you plant seeds, have you been planting seeds in a church? So I see three times, six or five seed. So that the pastor is the one collecting money every Sunday. I must mom up on a basket. I want to see what each, each person gives. Sure. What sort of church is that? This is clear. The text of scripture. We are not joking. Don't joke with God's money. It is not a love of money. He must manage, not me. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For is, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Are we talking? Is that a qualification? He must be, he must not be a recent convert, you know, to someone who says, I was in a vision. I was, I was saved yesterday in a vision. And the Lord told me, at the same time, I'm going to be a pastor. Which pastor? Which church? When was your pastor saved? When did he become a Christian? The apostle? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Every minister must be vetted. It does not end there. Let me turn to our Nicox. Nicox, we are here. He thought it's over. Verse number eight. Deacons, likewise. In other words, the same criteria. Because likewise, must be dignified. Not double tapped. Not addicted to much wine. Not greedy for dishonest gain. Same money. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested, tested fast. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. I like the word blameless. Are we together? Their wives are not left out. So a deacon qualifies with his wife. Are we together? Their wives, likewise, must be dignified. Not slanderous but sober-minded, faithful in all things, their wives. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own household well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Every minister must be better. Are you talking? And the question has to be why. Paul answered that question in the next verses. So let's read, continue reading. These are not my words. The Bible is talking here. Verse 14. I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing, I like these words. But I'm writing, why is he saying all those things? But I'm writing these things to you about overseers and deacons. Are you together? If I delay, you may, not, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and a buttress of the truth. So that you may know how one ought to behave in the house of God. Because this is public worship. This is public service. In the days of old, the priests are better. The days in which we live, the overseers or the pastors or the elders and the deacons are vetted. And I want to submit to you that if only the church followed this criteria, we would be having the ministry could have lose in the meeting. The nation would not have the shakaola. Because who vetted the shakaola guy? The result is that each person thinks that every pastor is a bad pastor, isn't it? If they see me around in town, they think that I've come for man, isn't it? The question has to be, who better? 
my dear sisters and brothers, if this is practiced, tell me if I thought the government can follow the church, like now Israel, that the government is going to regulate the church. Why should a government regulate the church if the church is self-governed? If those leading the church are qualified, why should the church, the government come in? They are coming in because you allow them to come in. Because they are joking around with the ministry. And so they are, they are, they are concerned that there is chaos and confusion. Yet we know that God is a God of, is a God of order and of peace, not of confusion. I want to end by saying this. We have just read the book of Hebrews, so I'm out of order from that, so that it's still fresh in our minds. Stand there. We are talking about the vetting of the ministers. Let's end with the priests. Because in this context, we are talking about the priests. Now, the question has to be that when our Savior, Jesus Christ, comes to the sin, when he comes to the earth, does he meet the criteria also? Because he suggests himself to the regulations that God had put in place. The question has to be, does Christ meet the criteria? So that we have confidence that even Christ himself, who is our high priest, qualified to be our priest. If you are there in Hebrews chapter 5, read with me. That it behooves Christ Jesus of Nazareth, even himself to qualify as a high priest. The same way we have seen in the book of Ezra, those priests had to prove their legitimacy. That they are faith to serve. The book of Hebrews and chapter number 5. From verse number 1. For every high priest chosen from among men, those are important, is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God. Are you together? Just as Aaron was. In other words, no one makes himself a priest, except when called by God, just like Aaron was called by God. We have seen that in the Old Covenant, the book of Ezra, they are careful to ensure that everyone claiming to be a priest must be, a, must be proved. It must be verified. It must be validated that you belong to Aaron. So they are establishing whether they meet the criteria. Do you belong to Aaron? And his household. Because the priesthood belonged to El. Now, the same principle applies to Christ in verse 5. The Bible says, so also, that same criteria, so also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest. Are you together? But was appointed by him who said, You are my son, they are begotten me. And he says also in another place, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Was Christ also appointed? Did he qualify? You know, that's the important question. Because Christ had this himself for this. He does not exalt himself alone. The Father exalts him and gives him the name above every name. That he becomes a high priest. Is exalted by the Father himself. He did not appoint himself. So I'm asking the question where do we get the audacity to appoint ourselves? As a bishop, as a pastor, as a reverend, as a apostle, as a prophet? If Christ himself doesn't appoint himself. The Bible says he was set a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, his priesthood endures forever. He qualifies to be our priest. We have seen the priest in the context of Ezra. As they returned to captivity, from captivity, as they restored back to the land, 
the priests also come and the priests are at the top of the list. Because that office of priest is important. Because the priest's task is to represent the people, as you have seen in verse number one, they must represent the people and they must sacrifice on behalf of the people. We in the new covenant require representation, mediation. We are sinners, and so a priest is required. Even in the new covenant, things haven't changed. The order has changed. In the old covenant it was the order of error. In the new covenant is the order of medicine. We require that mediation. That someone who qualifies, Christ Jesus, represents us today before the Father. He offered a one for all, one time offering on behalf of his people that all their sins may be taken away. That all their guilt may be taken away. That God may not remember their sins anymore. They ask you the question, who is your high priest? Now that you are saved, if at all you acknowledge that you are saved, if at all you are convinced that you are saved, like me, the question has to be, who pleads your case before God? Do you have a mediator before between God and man for him? What does it say to God about you? About your sins? There is not a single person who will transact business with God apart from a mediator. That particular day when men are judged, it will matter who represents you, just like in the court of law. To argue your case before God, to defend you, to say, not guilty, I have taken all his sins on my, my, myself. I bore his sins on my body of flesh. All his punishment came upon me. Therefore, let him go free. I have paid all his sins. The question has to be, who has paid for his sins? Is either you will pay for your sins, or your sins will be paid for. If you will pay for your sins, the place you pay for your sins is called hell. If your sins are paid for, the place they have been paid for, which will go is called heaven. Either way, sins will be paid. Either way. It only matters who pays. And so you require a priest. If you are left to pay for your sins, that's why hell is down. It is permanent because you cannot pay fully in all eternity. You will pay forever. That's why hell is forever. Please, let no one deceive you that you will be just there 30 days in hell. Some a thousand years. Eternity means forever. Because you cannot pay perfect blessings. Again, I say it matters who represents me before God. We have no human priest today. I'm not a priest. Let no one cheat you that there are priests in the Catholic tradition. There's no priest. The priest given to us is Christ Jesus. And so the question has to be before God in heaven, who represents him? Who pleads your case? Who says, I'm defending this person that like a lawyer can defend his plant? You require a priest. It is no wonder the priest begin that list. It is a superior office that Christ alone can fill that list. As you go back home, ask the question, who defends me from what? So I'm saying. Who pleads my case before God I'm saying that God forgive him. Forgive him is a sinner, but forgive him. Because I've paid all his sins. Please forgive him. <clears throat> Ask that question. And if you have never thought about that question, please let it sit and seal it in your mind. That you can look at the person of Christ as the priest and cry to him, Lord Jesus, please save me and represent me before the Father. Mediate for me. If I go to heaven, please speak a word for me to God that I may be spared. It's no wonder that thief on the cross 
The other one who was penitent, he, he, he knows who to tell and who to tell. He, he turns to Christ and tells him, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Because he knows the person who must remember you. This must be Christ. If Christ passes you by, you're doubt. If Christ has not remembered you before God, you're doubt. Plead with him to remember you. Tell him, Lord, remember me. Just like that thing, as simple as that, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember, I'm not doubt. But God forgives you. Amen.